this is the awkward phase. <laughs> <laughs> this is where my face. Are you going to introduce me, Steph? Can people yes, hear? Yes, I am. I'm going to drink from my my large tumbler of straight gin. Hello, SPN family. I'm Steph with Creation, and welcome to our super celebration of virtual experiences featuring the cast of Supernatural. Just a reminder that the top tipper wins a five-minute one-on-one video meet and greet with David right after this panel. So make sure your top supporter information is updated with your current email address. To find that, under the stage at screen, you'll see where it says Top Supporter Rewards. Scroll to the link that says Complete Your Top Supporter Information. If you'd like to tip, click the green tip button on the bottom left-hand corner of your stage at screen. Okay, first up today is a multifaceted actor known for being one of Hallmark's favorite leading men, and of course, Catching Supernatural. Please welcome the very talented Caden Jones. Hello, everyone. How are you? Your applause is deafening. This is so weird. It's weird, but it's better than nothing, isn't it? Hi, everybody. I can see your, uh, your wonderful your dialogue already happening here, and I've already got five questions um, teed up. Hi, Momo84. Hi, Moondoggy. You're all saying hi to each other as well. You see my eyes going down here. I got the little thing. The Giffinator, she's there. Oh, look at it. It's it's the crew. Gabby Brown. There's Cedar. Oh, DJ. Oh, there's Linda. I'm just going to read names. That's what I'm basically going to do. I'm just going to do like, do you guys remember a show called Romper Room? Did you have that? We had it in Canada. And they would look through this imaginary mirror and straight down the barrel to the audience. And they would go like, I see Joanne 2166. No, they, but they would give real names back then. I see Gypsy. I see uh, OGT in the Finger Lakes. So maybe I'll just do that for 45 minutes. I'll literally just not answer questions. And I'll say, I see Miss Humble. I see Fede, Fefe. Uh, I see uh, Ms. Betega, if I'm saying that right. Betega, 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 uh, Obrigado, Obrigado. No, that's uh, Portuguese. Um, See, oh yes, I get a shout out for Romper Room. Thanks, Nandri. Thanks, Nandri83. Um, my name is David Hayden Jones. As you know, um, if you're here for someone else, uh, I, would, I would get out immediately because we're going to get weird, we're going to get silly, and you're going to watch the part two of my decline into madness because I can't see any of your faces. So I'm just going to make believe that you're all smiling and uh, drunk like I am. Um, I'm not drunk. But this is, I will be. This is uh, just a tumbler full of gin. And it's uh, 945 on the Pacific Coast. And if you believe that that's gin, then the world is also flat and 5G caused coronavirus. You're welcome. It's good to live in a world where we have so much real information coming at us all the time, isn't it, folks? But that's getting political. That's getting big concept stuff. We'll, we'll Let's keep it. Let's we'll keep it. Thank you. Do you like my, I got a compliment on my purple jacket. Thank you, Mackenzie. I appreciate that. I tried to, uh, I tried to uh, clean it up for y'all this morning. I have literally been wearing mostly shorts, t-shirts and sweats for the last seven months. So um, since I last saw some of you, um, yeah, I haven't been, haven't been uh, putting the face on and, uh, you know, wearing the suit and the pocket squares. I kind of missed it. So I thought I would uh, thought I would try to gussy it up a bit for you today. Um, my hair is much shorter than when you last saw me. Uh, I think it was about uh, a foot and a half long. Everyone was saying it, who came to the last stage it was saying that uh, nice wig, and I think that's very rude. I think it's very rude to call someone's un unkempt hair a wig. So I apologize. You know, I don't apologize for my hair. You need to apologize. <laughs> me for calling it a wig but uh i've uh i've shorn it a little bit i'm cleaned up i'm getting back to business um and this sort of ties into some of the, some of the <laughs> thank you truculent demi troll thank you for being kind to me that's that's claire from the uk and and i just want to say before we get into questions here um on a semi-serious note but a, a very truthful from the heart note um thank you all for being here today um, I know that 
2020 has been challenging for us all. And um, I don't want to get into comparing our bag of rocks. I'm very privileged in many ways compared to a lot of people who have lost their jobs. Um, but, you know, my industry has suffered greatly from this as well. And it's uh, very surreal. It's very surreal not to have worked for seven months. And I'm sure there's a lot of you out there who have also maybe lost your jobs or um, been locked in your house, uh, been in quarantine and trying to stay sane and safe. And um, so I just want to, I really, really, really want to thank you for being here today and uh, supporting me and being kind to me and being interested in me. Um, just those very basic human kindnesses and um, I don't know, communion. I'm, uh, as you know, if you've been following me for a while or, or talking to me, uh, uh, I'm not about, I really don't like the popularity game. I do like the, um, the, the true intimacy game. And I mean, intimacy in that, that communion of real people coming together and just trying to be kind and, and, and be uh, the best humans that we can. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I will probably thank you again at the end of this. I'm excited for our full day together. I have a, a meet and greet after this, and then I have some personals. Um, so hopefully, uh, you feel my heart, you feel my gratitude, and um, it's so nice to just, even through this virtual world, be hanging out with you all again. So let's uh, let's start off with some good news. And um, this, one, this one ties in directly to what's happening. Gabe Muck. Okay, I'll say, sorry, I'm, I'm, some, of these, some of these handles <laughs> throw me off. I'm like, what's a, what's a Gabe Muck? Okay, they're questions and handles. Um, so someone is asking me, uh, have I been auditioning again? And that is the good news. Uh, it looks like film and TV um, is slowly starting to creep back forward. I'm sure that you know that Supernatural already wrapped. They're starting to film Hallmark movies again. And I've been uh, inquired about. Uh, no bookings as of yet. Um, but I've had some really great opportunities, which is nice. Um, and for those of you who are kind of interested in the inside sports of like a, a middle class working actor like me, not a, a celebrity or a famous person, um, which is only 1% of the industry, by the way. Uh, a lot of people don't know that the most of um, film and TV gets made by just kind of middle class, working class folk, um, of which I uh, include myself in. Um, the actor's job for most actors until you become really famous where they just throw more jobs your way is the real job of acting is auditioning. Um, you get what's called your sides uh, one or two days before and you got to prepare them. And, and now that uh, we're all virtual, you're in my, my home, uh, my home auditioning studio, so just a plain background and uh I've got a nice camera and some sound and I sort of gotten uh, like hipper to all the tech that's involved with kind of editing and uploading a, a, a tape. So the good news is I've had some really good um, opportunities. And after seven months of not having any opportunity, literally none other than um, these lovely things, which I'm so grateful for, um, the, it, that feels good. And I just got released from a, and when I say released, what happens is, is they, they will see maybe between 100 to 500 people for any given role. And then they narrow that down to a short list of like five. And then they do what's called, um, they pin you or avail you. And a pin or avail means that you're in the top two or three for a role. And so I was pinned for a really cool, fun uh, Netflix romantic comedy and it went the other way last week that's what the way agents say that they just went in a different direction <laughs> and this is the uh the, the cruel 98 percent uh rejection of this job um which you then have to reframe for possibility and positivity uh yeah you just gotta go okay well i was close that means i'm not i'm not doing 
everything wrong. Um, but anyone who's out there, an actor or performer, uh, they know that auditioning is 98% of the job. As we say, the gig is for free. You get paid for all those auditions that you, you didn't get paid for and all that time you spent. Um, and I still love the gig. So that's why I'm continuing to do it. It's nice to know that we're uh, with safe protocols and everything that we're getting back to it. And uh, so it's only been about a month of real full steam, but um, fingers crossed. I hope you can put out some good vibes there for me and uh, hopefully manifest some uh, interesting new work. The other thing too, that was weird about the, you know, obviously the pandemic is weird for everybody, but what made it kind of weirder for me was all of my work was stopping right before it anyways. So it was really weird. I've never in 22 years of being a professional actor, I've never had, you're always used to not working. That's just that, I mean, that's your life is, is, is lots of downtime in between shooting. Um, the weirdest thing is though that, that all my work stopped as well right before the pandemic anyways. So that was just sort of a weird uh, double, I don't know, psych, you know, psychological head game that was going on. Um, but anyways, I digress. But hopefully that gives you a sense of, of where I'm at in my career, uh, what's happening next. And the answer is I have no idea. Um, and I think I think we're living in a world of I have no idea what's happening next. So if there ever was um, a time to reflect and practice gratitude and practice living in the present, um, I think we've all had a lot of time to <laughs> meditate and self-evaluate and uh, and uh, figure out what's next. And the thing is, we don't know what's next. And I think that's part of our, all of our frustration. You know, life happens when you make other plans, as they say. But I think the practice has to be, um, you know, breathe deep, practice gratitude, and be ready for, for what's next. So there you go. Um, here endeth the lesson. <laughs> no, it's not Sunday. Oh, see. See, I can't see your faces. I don't know if you care. Who, how many people started napping? I don't know. The right thing will come along, says Mandy Hess. Thank you. I agree. The, it'll be the right thing when it's the right thing. And who knows? Uh, I have been, I, I've been reflecting on career and media in general, big philosophical ideas. Um, not to get too political, but I'm not a big fan of all media right now. So um, I'm also having like big philosophical discussions with myself whether I'm going to continue to be in media. So we'll find out more at the end of this year. I don't want to make any rash decisions based on, uh, you know, you, you're never supposed to make big decisions in the middle of crisis. So I'm going to let it all pan out. But uh, as I was telling people earlier, I'm a, I'm a country boy at heart. So, you know, moving out to the woods again and, and you know, just working on tiny houses and getting back to just building building stuff wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. So we'll see. Um, not making any decisions yet, but, uh, hopefully I still really love the job of acting and, um, get again, getting back to first principles. What do I really like? And my, my effort always was to just try to be a, um, a comedian. I started as a comedian, sketch comedian, entertainer, and then just trying to be the best actor I could. So I still love that journey. Um, I think I'm just going to try to cut out as much of the extraneous stuff from that uh simple purpose so um yeah we'll see we'll know more in a year uh so there you go hi <laughs> thanks Eximialigal. Eximialigal tipped me a thousand i don't know a, a life units is it are we playing diablo is it diablo gold mackenzie says make me a tiny house no you make me make you a tiny house I just given tiny houses away. <laughs> Kamara says she loves bacon. You're well, you're preaching to the choir here. Um, here we go. Uh, Moondoggy. Hi, Logan. 
what small gesture from a stranger made a big impact on you? Oh my gosh. I'm going to table that one because that's a really great question. You always have the big questions that are so philosophical. Um, I'm sure there's been many over my life. I'm not going to pick one, but I'm going to percolate on that. I think, Logan, you were the one who also asked me, like, if I was cremated, what album would I put it in? And the answer is Benny and the Jets. Uh, well, the Hello, Yellow Brick Road by uh, Elton John. Uh, Fefe, 72. I think that's you, Fed Day. Hi, Fed Day. Uh, grazie mille. What is the strangest thing you have had to learn to shoot a scene? Um, the strangest thing I had to learn. Well, I've been challenged. I had to relearn and really learn um, ice skating again uh, for a movie called uh, A Bramble House Christmas, which maybe some of you have seen out there. Um, I have the scene where I'm teaching the little boy to skate. And I, because uh, this might be sort of interesting to you, um, <laughs> but I don't know, because I don't know how many of you are napping already or, or, or have left. Um, the uh, when you grow up as a Canadian, you are expected to live on the ice. That's just that's just a basic, basic thing you are expected to do. You are you are supposed to be skating from a very young age. Now, I had a Welsh immigrant father and an American mother who, you know, was and they met in England and they came over, immigrated to Canada and they weren't, they were sort of erudite, you know, you know, posh, fancied herself rather posh, but moving to the middle of nowhere in the country. And so they weren't, my dad was a rugby player, so he wasn't really into hockey. And so as a, as a result, we didn't have a lot of money. That's the other thing. Like we were, I wouldn't say poor because we had so much love and so much community. But like financially, if I, when looking back, I mean, if you looked at the house I grew up in, in the middle of nowhere, um, you would be like, oh, okay. Yeah, you were, you were definitely an immigrant family uh, making your way in the wilds of Canada. Um, so I don't know if they couldn't afford good skates or they just didn't have any interest. But as a result, I never really learned how to skate, ice skate, as a Canadian. And you just have these things in your life where as you get older, you just kind of, you want to learn new things. I'm always wanting to learn new skills and, and ideas. And I was like, I got to slay this dragon. So I had done a movie previously with uh, Jason Priestley called Dear Santa, where I also was asked to ice skate. And when I got, when I got the news of that, um, I, I literally got the, the, the fop sweats because I was like, Oh my God, it's Jason Priestley. Who's by the way, a fantastic hockey player and figure skater. I know there's a great SNL sketch. If you look it up, Jason Priestley, uh, learning how to ice dance, it's hysterical. It is hysterical. So I Google it after this. Um, but he's like, he's, he's captain hockey, this guy. And, and I'm just like, I, I, you know, it, I didn't lie cause I had been rollerblading for a while. So I like, I had rollerblades in the uh, late nineties, 2000, you know, I would just wear my, uh, my short pants, my hot red, hot pink short pants and my, my leg warmers and just, you know, just go, just go skating by the beach. <laughs> Never did that either, but I did have rollerblades. Um, and so I, 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 I had gotten pretty good at that, but again, the, the thin blade on ice is, it's a whole different animal. And so I, uh, I sort of cheated my way through Dear Santa with Jason Priestley. I, and I said to him, I was like, I did practice before and I was like, was that okay? Was it like, like, listen, you're a dad, you're skating with your daughter, it was just fine. Now you didn't make any hockey stops, I wouldn't ask you to do anything hard. But at least Jason said, look, for what the movie is, for what you need to do in the movie, you're fine. And then in close-ups, I would put my boots on, and then I would pretend to stop. So, like, we did a like a whole movie magic trick where I would just get – I took the skates off whenever I could when we weren't seeing my feet. Um, so I was like, okay, uh, that's better. I don't have as much ice skating shame as that. Um, 
but uh, I still wanted to slay that dragon. So when when uh, when Bramble House Christmas came out, I had about three weeks of prep, which is usually I only get the offer, and you only have about five to seven days before you start shooting. This one I had, they had booked me early, which was great, and I had some time. But the point was, there's a scene where I actually know how to skate, and I'm teaching the heroine of the movie and the uh, the young boy how to skate. So I was like, oh, so I got to be the expert here. I, I, I Captain Canadian Canuck, I don't know how to skate, has got to be the expert. So um, uh, I just said, I'm I'm going to I'm going to fix my shame. So I was in Vancouver already at the time, and I decided I'm going to throw money and effort at the problem. I'm going to learn this new skill and slay this dragon so that I can just eliminate this mental block that I have from being a kid. And then the great cultural shame <laughs> as a Canadian, uh, you're like, you don't know how to skate? You didn't play hockey, bro? Oh, you're a total tooler, right? Oh, you don't play hockey? Oh, freaking buddy. No ketchup chips for you, right? Um, yeah, that's that's what I had to deal deal with as a kid. And I know there's some Canucks out there, or at least uh, uh, enthusiasts of Canadian confections who know what ketchup crisps are. Um, and that's crisps for the UK mates. See what I did there? Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Long story short, I know it's long, but we got to fill up 45 minutes, folks, and I can't see faces, so I'm just going to I'm gonna ramble on. I'm going to ramble on like I'm writing in my diary, my virtual diary with lots of eyeballs on it. Um, so I hired one of the best hockey skating coaches in town, in Vancouver, who actually works with NHL players, <laughs> to, and she comes from the figure skating world, and there was this big movement in, uh, in hockey to learn uh, from the paradigms and the skill sets of figure skating in terms of elegance and stopping and strength training and all that sort of stuff. So you have all these butch hockey men learning from this incredibly powerful yet petite woman. She was a woman, by the way. Such an incredible teacher. And I did about five private lessons with her. And then every day I would just go out to the what's called the public skates. And, and Vancouver has amazing amount of rec centers and they actually have ice because it's Canada they have ice all year round so I would just go online and I'd be like oh there's a free skate over here I'll just go practice and then I would I would I would I would do training and uh, she took me once to the like the big NHL training center what they have a camp out here and uh, yeah so in the span of two and a half weeks I actually became a very proficient skater. I could skate on one, on both edges. I could do one leg stuff. I, she's had me doing twirls by the end of it. So, and a hockey stop. That's the other thing. If you know anything about skating, be able to do a like a nice crisp hockey stop. Um, it's kind of a it's kind of a big deal. So, um, yeah, I know that sounds so silly, probably to all of you, and but it's it's just one of those. It's one of those things that, you know, if you have that thing in your mind and you've always wanted to do whatever the skill is, um, take some time, learn a new skill. It's so good for the brain. Challenge yourself and exorcise the demon. <laughs> uh, you know, pun, metaphor intended uh, in the supernatural world. Um, just, yeah, just get that out of your psyche and sort of kill it. So the next one for me is because I really want to learn how to ride a motorcycle. And I, we, my mom was adamant that, you know, we don't ride motorcycles because unfortunately there were some real tragedies in our family, like at Christmas. I'm not going to, won't get maudlin about it, but she had, she had trauma from motorcycles and absolutely rightly so if, if you know the story. But, uh, but now that I'm a grown up with my own money and I want to, and you know, we realize that life is fleeting and life is precious, you know, and we can't live in fear. And uh, so I'm gonna learn how to ride a motorcycle next. So there you go. Stay tuned. <laughs> um, I wanna go back to Moondoggy. What small gesture from a stranger made a big impact on you? Obviously there's many uh, along the way. It's hard to make a specific one. And, 
I'm reticent to share this because I'm fearful that it'll sound like pandering and it's really not. Um, but I was just, I had to move again because of the pandemic. I had to pack up stuff and unpack stuff in the last month as well. So that was fun. Um, but I had this box of all these incredible less than three LTTU and um, fan binders and art that uh, <laughs> um, that wasn't expected. Sorry. Um, taking a minute. This is live. Hi. Um, and it was, it was, it was really nice to unpack that stuff and reread all those kind notes of community and, um, incredible pieces of art. And I have, I've, um, I've kept every single one and they're now on my shelf by my office. And, um, they, they give me great strength. And again, back to basics of real connection, not this avatar of social media. Really, what the wonderful thing is that conventions did was being able to talk to members of the audience, like real, see faces, have real interaction. We, are, we live in such a world of persona and performance and ideas of people and uh whether whether you're on a tv show or not i mean you know we all know that there's that instagram and facebook are performative you know there's there's real life and then there's this avatar of ourselves and i always want to get back to truth and reality and you can only really get that one-on-one -on -one and in real life so um that's my goal and so, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to anyone who's written me a kind note or a piece of art. I've kept it all. And uh, it is now uh, giving me strength and hope and, and, uh, and a little bit of faith in the future. And, and maybe I'll keep doing this job a little bit longer. We'll see. There you go. There, there's your pander. It's not pandering. It's from the heart. Um, Effulgent, effulgent. Can someone tell? Can can someone tell me what effulgent is? Is that a thing? Is that a word? Or is it? Come on, some someone give me some love. Effulgent. All right. Oh, truck, Claire. I do need a tissue. Mind your manners. Mind your manners, mate. How dare you? Um, but uh. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. Um, I don't, no one's helping me with effulgent. Okay, here we go. Um, tell us funny stories about working with Adam Fergus. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough time. That man, I adore him. He has become a true friend. And uh, he is just, he is the best of that Irish, gregarious, always up for a laugh, always up for some fun. Um, I just, I truly adore his energy and he is just one of the funniest guys you're ever going to meet. I know a lot of you know that. Um, but he is just, he's always up for just some playful cheekiness and, and, and ball busting and, and in the bright loving kind of way. So, um, I'm trying to think if I have any dirt, well, that's the thing. If I had actually any real dirt on him, and by dirt, I just mean like, you know, private craziness with the cast and crew. Um, I wouldn't share it anyways, because I'm not that guy. Um, but, but yeah, let it be known that he's just a good time. He's fun. He's a fun guy to hang out with. Absolutely. Um, da, 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 look in the question. Look in the question. Cheeky Fi. Congratulations, Cheeky Fi. I know you. There's another UK mate. If you could be any character in a Halloween movie, what would it be and why? Um, okay, this is my improv brain coming off the top of my head. 
and I just it just popped in right now. Um, it'd be fun to do a live action Charlie Brown and the Great Pumpkin, where you just did this whole like sort of they did with Riverdale, but you make it this really gruesome um, horror story, and you you cast you know a nice and it's a like Steven Spielberg esque like real kids, so basically a bald a bald young kid. But the great pumpkin is real and no one believes him, just like in other horror movies until the very end. And then they have to go fight the great pumpkin. But the pumpkin is has a head not not much larger than mine. I mean, I could play the role very well, just you, very few prosthetics, but maybe some mangy pumpkin teeth, maybe just round out the dome here a little bit. And uh, just like have a really dark, grisly, the great pumpkin horror movie. Charlie Brown. There you go. I, I, I patented it here. No, I didn't. Pat copyrighted it. See? I don't even know words anymore. It's terrible. Um, did Dave take anything home? This is from Gabe Muck. Gabe M-U-C. I hope I'm getting that right. It's probably not your real name, Gabe Muck. Gabe M-U-C. Uh, did Dave take anything home from set as a souvenir? Um, uh, Kind of, if you consider saucy socks, uh, I take all my socks home because why give them back? So I have so many cool saucy socks from Catch and other movies. Um, and actually, this blazer that you're watching right now, on some of on some of the movies I get, especially the Hallmark ones, I get to uh, I get to keep wardrobe. It's built into my contract. So yeah, I've actually got a nice uh closet full of jeans and blazers and and nice be people with way better taste than I do who buy my clothes for my character so I get to keep some of that so that's cool um Ritter Lynn I hope that's I, th I hope that's grandma Goodwitch out there much love Linda did you polish up any of your screenplays in that desk drawer I have not um I did submit my animated feature to my agent at the beginning of quarantine because I requested it. Um, they loved it, but it looks like that's just not what Hollywood is buying right now. So it looks like I'll probably, once things, I got to kind of get my acting flow back. And then once I got a little income coming in, um, I do have very good representation. So, and I do have some uh, cartoon guys, like really high end, um, animators that I met in uh, New Zealand, actually. So another wonderful kind of um, thing from that. Uh, so yeah, I've got these connections. I know the animation world. We got really close to getting a greenlit. We actually did get greenlit once. And in the world of Hollywood, that means we're going to go forward with your movie. And with 90% of big movies, it's called Turnaround for those who are interested at home and the inside sports and making the sausage of um, film and TV, 90% of them go into turnaround, what's called, and they don't get made. So even when you're hired, uh, very often in Hollywood, they end up not making the thing. So it, it, that's the truth that happens all the time. It, it, you can't take it personally because it happens to everyone. Everyone's got that story. I mean, I know filmmakers who took them 11 years to get their screenplay made. So you want to talk about perseverance um, and uh, not to name drop here at all, but I'm going to, cause I know their story fully. Um, I know uh, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck from the, their Boston days. Cause I was dating a girl from Boston at that time and she was best friends with them. And I knew them before they were Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. And I knew the whole story of like getting goodwill hunting made. And so when I saw those guys, uh, end up making the movie in Toronto and we hung out at the bar and like no one knew what that was going to be. And I know how hard they had worked and for how long they had to get that movie made. So <clears throat> again, not name droppy Hollywood stuff, just, you know, you never know what's going to hit with people and you never know uh, when a, a piece of art is going to get made. So the thing is you just have to have the belief in what you're making and what the story you're telling is. And then just sheer grit, determination, and uh, perseverance. That's, that's, uh, 
90% of what this business is about. Um, talent is part of it. Um, but boy, you know, just hanging in there, uh, will, will win over talent, uh, any day of the week. And that's, and that's, I think a good thing for a lot of people to realize in their own lives, you know, with, where maybe they're in a business that's not as competitive. Tell you what, I mean, perseverance is, as we, as we know now in this, in this world is finding, digging deep down and, and going, getting on with our day to day and, and just finding our way out the other side. So, um, I wish you all in your own lives, uh, finding gratitude, grit, and perseverance. So there you go. Um, what is my pandemic jam? Patty Hewitt, Barbara, Barbara. Um, what is your pandemic jam? Now, are you asking me if, 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 if I've started preserving berries and marmalades, marmalades? Um, or are you talking about music? I, I haven't been canning. Although that would be pretty good for a pandemic. I wish I knew how to can. Uh, all the canners and preserving people out there, um, let me know. Give me a shout out. <laughs> I need it for my bunker that I'm making. I need to learn how to preserve things. But I think Patty Hewitt Barbara is asking what my jam is, like on the on the Spotify. Again, I've been sort of going back to old school basics. And... Uh, I've been playing uh, a lot of Beastie Boys, a lot of Beastie Boys on rotation, just because it energizes me. Um, I just watched their uh, documentary on um, Apple TV, which I really loved, directed by Spike Jones. So, uh, yeah, all the old school intergalactic, B-Boy, Booyah Bays, all that stuff. Keep me happy. Keep me dancing in my house without my pants. Effulgent is back. It's a word that Spike uses in poetry in Buffy Angel. Effulgent. I'm going to look it up after. If someone can uh, Google the, if there, it's an actual word, I'd love to share with you all what the, uh, what the, what the real deal is. Answer. Brittany is saying answer. I assume that's you pointing up to effulgent. Holly Blades tipped a hundred. Oh my goodness. Hi, Holly. Hope you're enjoying your tumbler of gin like I am. This is a UK mate who's been very kind. Uh. Radiant. Linda, Granny Goodwitch for the win, I think. Effulgent means radiant. I love it. See, look at this. Fulgent, radiant, shining brightly. Beautiful. Radiant, shining brightly. Erasure. Fleetwood. Beautiful South. Erasure, sure. Hey, David, you were in the world of, oh, this is going too fast. Anyways, uh, I, I'm being, um, Holly, hi, Dally, aka Dally, another UK mate. I'm so, I'm so glad that we did this early in the morning because I had heard before from German folks and, and, um, and UK folks. It's like, it's too late. It's the middle of the night for us. So I said specifically, let's do brunch, breakfast, and then we can get uh, some more people from all over the globe. Uh, what is my favorite scary movie? Shining, period, full stop, The Shining. And it's not chock full of scares, but um, there's just imagery and iconic stuff in that where the elevators, the you know, Kubrick, you know, doing the, the, the blood coming out of the elevators. The twins, oh, the twins. I think I, I, think I saw The Shining too young too, honestly, which is kind of good and kind of bad. Um, because it can scar you, it gives you bad dreams, but then you you process it. But I think I saw The Shining when I was 12, and that might be too young. And those twins, those twins in the hallway, man, forget about it. And then the blood elevator. Eh, it's terrible, but it's so good. It's so good. It's one of my favorite movies, actually, uh, other than horror. Oh, Joanna22, this is a great question. This is a supernatural question. Um, what, what, which character do you wish Ketch would have had more scenes with? 100% Crowley. Crowley, Crowley, Crowley. And um, I'm, I'm so glad I finally got to have a scene with Rowena because I was wanting to kind of tie that in together. Um, we have this fantasy, Ruth and I, we were talking about it. I was like, you know what I want, you know what, you know what I want a one-off movie to be? 
is like Rowena as Queen of Hell because she's amazing. She's unbelievable. And that just imagine her running Hell. Like you could just do a mini series on that. But have the reveal being almost like a knight is is demon catch or catch in hell as her manservant, her her knight, her her left hand helping her run hell. And you just reveal and it's catch. So that would be kind of fun. But so I was so glad to have scenes with Ruth finally. And like we had such a good time. Um, well, she told me she had a good time. I can't speak for her. I had a great time. Um, I'm going to believe her. I choose to believe her. Uh, she's been very kind to me. And um, <laughs> the, uh, I just, we know that Ketch and Crowley knew each other because there's that whole backstory about how he got the hellhound. So the British man of letters knew about Crowley and there, and Ketch definitely was uh, an ambassador, if you will, a uh, emissary to Crowley and the, the nether world. Um, so yeah, and I just I love Mark Shepard so much. He's such a great dude. We have some really good times. We've only really met each other at the at conventions, but I just love his brain. I love his talent, and I just think a Crowley catch scene or two would have been uh, super fun. And and I just know that working with Mark would have really liked up my game because I respect him so much as an actor, and he's just just a great guy. So yeah, there you go. Sarah G thirteen. I think this is my Winnipeg peeps. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah G13. I think this is, uh, I'm pretty good with the names and the faces now. Well, the names, not so much, but the faces. Uh, and if it's a D&D &D question, I'm pretty sure it's you in Win Winterpeg. Um, do you have snow yet? Confirm that on the side. Um, hey, David, if you were in the world of D&D, &D, what would you, what would your chosen class be is why? Oh, ah, this is so good question. And I just, in quarantine, I just started playing Diablo again, uh, which is obviously totally D&D, &D, Diablo 3, which is D&D &D inspired, as I'm sure you know. Um, and it's just like dumb and fun and just collecting treasure and getting hit points and da, 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 da. So, but I haven't opened my D&D &D books in a long time. So I hope I'm getting this right. Please don't nerd shame me. And you can just correct me and bring me along um, and be be kind and gentle and and remind me if I'm getting it wrong. But I think I would really like to just do something in the in the the magic or magician or wizard realm. Um because basically I just want to one time in my life see lightning come out of my fingers. I don't think that's wrong. I don't think that's I would do it for justice. I would do it for kindness, but I would I would I would like to kill monsters with lots of lightning coming out of my fingertips. That's one of my favorite special effects. Just like <sighs> still gotta be a boy some sometimes, huh? Last question. Lari Betega. I believe she is from Argentina. I'm getting gonna get all the Spanish accents wrong. I know that. Don't judge me. I'm trying. Or maybe I shouldn't try. I just love accents and language. Um, what 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 was fun to do once, but you'll never do it again? Oh gosh, that's very personal. <laughs> oh gosh, there is the real answer, and then there is the uh, for public consumption only answer. Hmm. Gosh, how do I? How do we how, how do we do that in this world of misinformation and uh, and avatars of selves where where you're dealing with privacy but you're also dealing with like uh, fun stories? What was the one thing that you have done that you would never do again? Um, <laughs> uh, I would like to say skydiving because that's I'm I'm going to do that next, but that doesn't count. Um, I'd like to say bungee jumping, but I missed that chance. Because I, I know that I want to do those things, but I know that I'll only do them once. I'm not one of these thrill seeker guys. I don't need like a lot of adrenaline junkie, but I do want to have like curated experiences that I know I'll never do again, but it would be a rush. Um, I'm stalling. I'm 100% stalling. I will admit it. 
I'm here to tell you, I'll be honest with you, I'm stalling because what's the one most fun thing that I'm going to do? How about something? I'm Okay, I'm going to tell you this right now. I don't want you to be concerned for me. Um, I am going to go in two weeks with a Sherpa in the woods uh, and a very curated, targeted, medically um, supervised journey of psilocybin. Legal, curated, and if you don't know what psilocybin is, it's going to be a mushroom trip. There you go. So, and I know I'm only going to do it once, and it's not recreational drug use. It's actually going to be medicinal and spiritual, and that's probably more information that I should be sharing, but who cares? We're all going to die. The end of the world is here. Who cares? There you go. That's what I'm doing in two weeks. So if you don't hear from me again, you'll know that I'm with the Lizard King and the Goat Man and uh, seeing colors and the beauty of the real universe around us. And I've stepped out of the matrix and I'm living my truest spiritual self. There you go. The real poop. Um, I love you all. I've been told that's the last question. I think we're, <laughs> Joanna says, David, no. David, no. Stop. Be safe. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now I'm concerned. All right. Well, will I be selling your clothing line for Christmas? Uh, when I get, <laughs> Moondoggy says, don't combine it with skydiving. Um, my hubby is jealous, says Nandri. All right. Judith. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Klepto Monkey. David, I'm here. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. It's like, again, I may not be acting. You may not see my face in a year anyways. It doesn't matter. It's all been, we've, we've had a good run. Um, I thank you all. Uh, I'm sorry I got a little emotional there. I, so I, you know, that's not performative at all. Like, it caught me off a guard. But it's it's been a weird, I'm a social guy, and and it's been weird not, seeing your faces. There was supposed to be a lot of fun to be had this year. Hopefully it's just delayed. Hopefully we'll get back to living in the real world. And uh, I just really, I can't thank you all enough for showing any interest in my career, in me as a person and um, being always being incredibly kind and supportive. So it means the world to me. It really does. I thank you so much. Bye. And now this, I say goodbye and I still hang out here for like 12 minutes looking awkward. David, thank you so much for being here today. We love you, we're happy to support you, and we're sending you all the positive vibes in the world. All right guys, tipping is now done, and we'll bring you the results in just a few moments. But first, make sure you're signed up for our email list uh, through our website, creationent.com. And make sure you're following us on social media at creationent on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for announcements on more virtual content to come. David's meet and greet is coming up as well as his one-on-one -on -one chats. And we'll also be back with the lovely Samantha Smith. So don't miss out. Okay. Our winner is Gypsy NY. Gypsy NY, you are the winner of the five-minute one-on-one video meet and greet with David that's happening right after.